And we have uh, David Morris in the studio. Good morning, David. Good morning. Well, thanks so much for coming in. You um, are a part-time local resident of Point Ray Station, although the rumor is you're, you're actually moving here full-time at some point. You are also, I believe, the founder of the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. Is that yes, the founder of the co-founder of co-founder. the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. That's exactly right. Forty-three years old in May. Forty-three years old. So, um, you know, out here in West Marin, the the conversation around localization is very trendy and popular. Whether it's locavores for food or local energy supplies, but uh, seventy-four. That wasn't. So much the case back then. I'm just curious, how, you know, what prompted you to create this organization? How did it sort of come together back way back when? Well, there were a lot of threads, but essentially, what we what we realized was that cities had authority; they had significant authority, <laughs> uh, and that it was the government closest to the people, uh, and and therefore it could speak to people with relatively little overhead. If you wanted to run for office, you didn't need a million dollars or a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then the other aspect of it was that technology was, we thought, becoming decentralist in its orientation. This is the early 1970s, and so we were sort of coming out of that 100, 150-year period of shifting from wood to steel, which means from small to big, shifting from uh, water power to fossil fuels, which meant more concentrated, shifting from batch processing to mass assembly, you know, production. So we were literally the technologies that were driving the scale of uh, our economic system and our corporations. And by the early 70s, we perceived a pattern the way we were going to move in the in the uh, in the other direction, and it's 2017, and that's not controversial any longer. Um, but you know, you can you can begin to think of a city actually producing real wealth internal to its to its borders, whether it's uh, renewables and solar, or whether it's um, uh, desktop manufacturing, uh, you know, and the like. So those were the different threads that that uh, that came together. But it was 1974, uh, and in 1974, the Federal government was pouring money into cities uh, and states. Uh, cities were doing, for the most part, relatively well. There were cities like Detroit and Cleveland that were beginning to lose population, but it wasn't a, a crisis at that point. Uh, and uh, and environmentalists hated cities. Uh, the, uh, oh, really? Absolutely. If you talk to environmentalists in 1974, and they thought it was a, a blot on the planet. Uh, and that we we should all you know live in in uh, in sort of self sufficient communities and you know and the like. So so it was a it was an interesting time to essentially talk about decentralization. Right now, was the energy crisis sort of part of, the, of this as well, or not really? Yes, it was. A, it was one of the precipitating events. Uh, this was 1974, and so the oil price increase went up by o- almost 400 percent in uh, late 1973, uh, and the federal government <clears throat> did a blueprint. A project independence, mm-hmm. and they looked at every possible technology. It was thousands and thousands of pages, which, by the way, when Ronald Reagan came in, he threw away. Um, but those of us who saved it, uh, and and looking through it, it was pretty clear that solar uh, was the decentralist a possible future, and just serendipitously, the first terrestrial manufacturer of solar. Uh, cells uh, set up 20 miles from the Institute four months before the Institute for Local Self-Reliance was born. So we got to go and visit Joseph Lindmayer, a physicist, Hungarian refugee who founded the company. We got to go out there and, and look at the very primitive way in which they were making solar cells and let him say, well, you see how primitive this all is? If we could automate it, the price would come down considerably. So, so yes, the energy crisis was a, was a precipitating event, in part because it showed us what the dangers of dependence were, and in part because it was catalyzing a, a possible new decentralist technology future. Now, um, is... Uh, where are you based? Is it Minneapolis, Minnesota, or where is the... Well, we started in Washington, D.C. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes, All yes. Right. And, and, and one of the other factors was that for people who don't know, Washington, D.C., after the Civil War, gave up its its independence, essentially. It was not a independent city after that. And it was ruled by three uh, commissioners who were appointed by mostly Southern congressmen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in 1964, 
64, I believe it was, 62, by congressional uh, amendment, uh, the citizens of the District of Columbia got the right to vote for president. And in 1968, they got the right to vote for the school board. Mm -hmm. And in 1972, they got the right to vote for city council and mayor. Uh, and so we were there at that moment where this city was sort of becoming a state uh, mm -hmm. and a self-governing body. And so it was sort of interesting to see what what might be able to be done in in the District of Columbia. And uh, and so we, we, we focused on the district for the, the first few years and then realized that it was odd to talk about local self-reliance in a city that ran on everybody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. But uh, so uh, where is the Institute then based today? Is it still in D.C.? I thought it was Minneapolis. For some reason, I have Minnesota in my mind. I, yes, I, it's, okay. it's, uh, it's in D.C., but the, but the uh, largest office is in Minneapolis right okay. now. And then we have a small office in Portland, Maine. Oh, okay. All right. Now, um, yeah, that's interesting about solar. Um, I didn't, yeah, you know, it's... It's amazing what's happened with solar, and I suppose in some ways, you know, it used so when I started writing about energy was in the 80s, I guess, um, and I remember at the time I was writing for a publication with East Coast editors, and they kept going, you're coming up with these stories about solar and wind in California, that's just a California thing, you know, that was kind of their perception, or the other thing was, you know, solar's great. But it's the most expensive resource. You know, that was the other thing. Even among environmentalists who were saying, you know, in some ways arguing bigger is better. You know, we need to do because solar is small, but it's expensive. Uh, are you surprised? It doesn't sound like you probably are. At what's happened with solar? It's like every forecast about how cheap it would become has basically been wrong, kind of underestimating how fast it, the price would come down. Are you surprised by what's happened or probably well, not? Or well, I'm not sure uh, what you're going to uh, say. Not, not, well, uh, our first publication of the Institute for Local Self Reliance was a publication called The Dawning of Solar Cells. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was 1975. Mm -hmm. uh, a little premature, yeah. uh, if you will. The thing about solar cells is that they've always had a, uh, an unsubsidized market which is the remote market, and they can compete with uh, batteries. They can compete right. with having to send helicopters in and, and, uh, and replenish the, the fossil, the, the gasoline or the diesel fuel uh, supply. So they've always had a, a market, right. uh, and, uh, and uh, they began to be put on vacation homes and second homes in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And 1999 is when there were more installations of solar that were grid-connected than when non-grid connected. Right. And then in 2006, 2007, when China came in, there was, there was that moment in which the price just, uh, just collapsed. So right. I would say that we were probably premature, but one of the things that we preach at, in local self-reliance is that a city should think of itself as a nation. Not autarkic, not self-sufficient. Nations are not autarkic and self-sufficient, but self-conscious and self-reliant, and that it should track the flow of resources internal to its borders and through its borders, and it should tap into local resources and get the maximum value out of them, whether they're human resources, capital resources, natural resources. And when you, and when you look at that, you think, well, what do, we, what do we have as a city in terms of natural resources? Well, sun that falls, rain you know, that, that falls, you know, on the city. Uh, we have waste, and we can minimize the waste, but we are going to have solid waste, and if we can recycle that and then build in uh, small-scale scrap manufacturing, and by the way, scrap manufacturing is always smaller scale than virgin uh, material manufacturing, uh, then you can begin to think of the city in a, in, a, in a different way. That was 1974. In about 10, 15 years ago, 2002, 2003, we added to the specific sectors that we focus on telecommunications. And we have been working with cities for them to build their own fiber networks. You know, cities own the roads, they own the water pipes, and nobody seems to call those socialist systems, right? And they're, they're infrastructure, and they make sense to be essential physical infrastructure. And fiber networks are now essential uh, infrastructure, and we're also learning that, that it, essentially, your cable company and your telephone company are monopolies. They are unresponsive, and since they are making out like bandits with, uh, with essentially a distribution system that was paid off 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, they'll they'll upgrade, but they're going to upgrade very slowly and 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 mostly in, in protest. 
And so we've been working with cities, and there are now almost 500 cities that have fiber networks, partial, uh, and over 100 cities that have citywide fiber networks, uh, and they compete. Uh, with the with the cable companies and with the telephone companies, and they compete very successfully. Uh, so we have been, you know, trying to preach to cities that even the physical infrastructure is very important. And the thing is that if a city owns its own broadband network, it doesn't have to worry much about things like net neutrality or the digital divide. It is in charge of the rules of the road. So right. if this and it's it's the government closest to the people. So if the people want a certain kind of rule, uh, they can make it happen without having go to the Federal Communications Commission and then go to court and then try to get Comcast not to take over your state legislature uh, and preempt your authority from doing it. There are 17 states right now that because their cities were successful at building their own municipal networks, have preempted their the right of new cities from doing it. Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, you've been talking a lot about cities. Is that the focus, or do you also work with counties or, you know, more like rural areas like we are here in West Marin? Is that also part of it, or is it primarily cities? No, it's it's cities and it's counties. It's uh, it's it's rural areas, but we tend to focus on uh, on a place that has a government structure that can be useful. Right. So it, it, would, it wouldn't it would be necessarily a region. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it could be a county. Uh, w- once again, when it comes to municipal uh, broadband, the most interesting things that are going on right now are in rural areas, and in rural areas almost entirely, the fiber networks are owned by the uh, cooperative electric companies or the cooperative telephone companies. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, for people who are interested in the history of politics, the New Deal, uh, one of the things that it created right. were the, was the rural electrification program, right. in which it gave 50-year financing. Uh, for people to essentially build their own electric systems, and people owned those electric systems. Electric systems. They had to give ten dollars, uh, and then they became a member of it. So they owned them. And in the late 1940s, they expanded that to telephone. So there are a lot of telephone cooperatives and mom and pop mm-hmm. telephone companies, uh, and there are a lot of uh, 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 rural electric uh, utilities. And both of them tend to be the prime movers uh, mm-hmm. in putting in fiber. We also look at states, uh, and, you know, we are at a moment now, because of this federal government, where the only thing left is a few blue states uh, and a lot of blue cities in red states that would like to preempt the authority of blue cities from doing anything. Um, so we are at a moment here where the, the fight is both defensive but can also be proactive, uh, and so the states become a, a real key it, the the uh, courts have decided that cities are a mere creature of the states, and states can do anything that they want, essentially, to a city, including in most states abolishing a city if it decides to do that. Oh, really? Uh, so that, because cities are not mentioned in the Constitution, you know, the municipal corporation is not mentioned in the Constitution, and the private corporation is not mentioned in the Constitution. Well, the Supreme Court has decided that because the municipal corporation is not mentioned in the Constitution, it has no authority, and the state can do anything it wants. It's a mere creature of the state. It also decided that because the private corporation is not mentioned in the Constitution, it's a person, and it has complete authority as if it were a human being. That's kind of odd, uh (laughs) you might say. Mm -hmm. Um, Now... You know, I'm just thinking about the name of your organization, Institute for Local Self-Reliance. When you created it, obviously, as you mentioned, the 70s, things were different. And when you think of self-reliance now in 2017, and that's why I think, you know, your focus on fiber networks is sort of, you know, in a way shows like sort of the evolution of the thinking. But did you ever envision what that concept, have you sort of reinterpreted what local self-reliance means over time? Or has your concept sort of been pretty steady or does it keep kind of changing with the times? I'm just no, curious. I, I, think, I think it's been pretty steady. Uh, I, I mean, when we kind of perceived the future in the late 1970s, early 1980s, we perceived the idea of sort of personal computers and cities inventing new ways of doing things and then exporting them mm-hmm. via what you know became the web right. um, but uh, you know sort of a horizontal transfer <laughs> mm-hmm. of information and uh, you know and innovation uh, and we still we we work with uh, the independent businesses a great deal we've set up 
We've set up maybe over 100 uh, local independent business associations in the country. And about five years ago, we set up a uh, an association of uh, trade associations of independent businesses. So the independent retail uh, pharmacies and, and retail uh, hardware stores and bookstores, you know, and the like have co- sort of come together in trade associations. And then this is a kind of a trade association of trade associations. And so we have, we've set them up and, and what they are is an alternative chamber of commerce. Uh, now they almost all of them are members of the Chamber of Commerce, and so their interests overlap. But at the same time, they have a distinct uh, interest in in, uh, in in warding off the Amazons and the WalMarts of the world. Uh, whereas the Amazons and the WalMarts of the world are part of the Chamber of Commerce, and all they care about is no regulation and no taxes. So they 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 are on a parallel structure with the Chamber of Commerce, and sometimes they they oppose them. For example, in New York State, which was the first state to impose a sales tax on uh, on Amazon, uh, mm-hmm. it was the independent business associations that went to Albany and said, those other business associations that have been talking to you don't represent all businesses. We represent 90% of businesses. Uh, and, and that was very useful in getting it through. Sure. Now, um, in terms of the breadth we've talked about uh you know, fiber and sort of uh, phone. Um, we haven't talked too much about energy, but I tend to talk about energy a lot on my show anyhow. So, but what else, what other kinds of, uh, I think you're involved with food issues perhaps, or, or maybe not, but we'll kind of give us broader sense of how, how broad do you take this concept of self-reliance? Well, we take, we take the concept quite broadly. Uh, food, where we, we were involved at the beginning, that is something that actually evolved. We, we, uh, we were involved with uh, neighborhood gardens. We were involved in urban food production. Uh, one of the things in Washington, D.C., where we were born, is that they have a height limitation. And so if you look down from the sky, you see a whole bunch of flat roofs uh, about 10 stories up, which is good for solar but is also good for greenhouses. So we looked at that, but then we realized that essentially food production is not an urban uh, concept. Uh, but we did look at uh, – we have worked with farmers – uh, on value added uh, in terms of food production, but broadly we're interested in things like uh, expanding the commons, expanding the, expanding the things that that we own in common. Uh, Philadelphia, about I think last six months ago, nine months ago, Philadelphia uh, uh, passed a soda tax. Now it's 1.5 cents per ounce. Now think of that. Okay, 1.5 cents an ounce is a hefty tax. You know, if you got a 16 ounce, you know, yeah, that's a hefty tax, right? right. 1.5 cents per ounce. It's uh, raising about 90 million dollars a year, and it's specifically dedicated to expanding the commons, which means libraries, uh, rec centers, uh, parks, uh, and pre-K, uh, essentially uh, pre-kindergarten uh, universal education. So that's that's a dramatically interesting in, in, in you know way forward, and it's a city uh, that did that. Uh, you have in San Antonio there was a, a referendum, and the people taxed themselves a sales tax, a wide uh, a broad sales tax, uh, to raise thirty million dollars a year for universal pre-K. There are forty states that have pre-K financing programs. But uh, but only but uh, you know no more than nine uh, cover more than fifty percent and San Antonio will be a hundred percent. So it's 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 broad in the sense that there are things that we share whether it's kids, a public school system, a public park, a public recreation center, uh, and we want to expand that into a publicly owned fiber network, a publicly owned you know solar facility. Uh, take your take your um, your uh, your sewage plant and make it a, a natural gas plant as well. Take your food you take your your your, your uh, food wastes and organic wastes. Uh, and make them into compost, and then at the same time get some gas out of that as well. So essentially using our ingenuity to to tap into uh, our kind of native ingenuity. Uh, and when we develop something that is that is um, that is useful uh, to other cities and other another uh, either here or abroad, uh, we share it with them. Uh, and so the nice thing about the city networks is that it, it is international. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Um, so, and so, but most of your 
members are in the U.S., I assume, or, or no, maybe not. Yes, most of our members are in the U.S. We have, we've worked in Latin America. We've mm-hmm. worked in, uh, you know, in Europe. Uh, and, uh, but most are in, in, the, uh, in the United States. There are a few federalist systems in the, in the, in the, uh, in the world. Germany, for example, has a similar federal system uh, than we do. Uh, but in a lot of the developing countries, uh, cities are enormous. Right. Uh, and so people have been pouring off of the farm in a very much quicker than they ever did in the United States. Uh, and so you have cities of 10 million, 20 million, even 30 million people. And, and we, we don't know, we don't know what to do with a scale that, that's, that's that large. Sure. Um, so we don't, you know, we, we don't, we don't, even New York City to us is, is too large to think of as a city. On the other hand, it's broken up into boroughs. I grew up in Queens. Queens itself has neighborhoods. So we, it, it, it's, you can, in fact, parcel it out mm-hmm. and think of Queens. You know, Brooklyn was the third largest. It has a little sign. I think it still does. When you come into Brooklyn, you're entering the third largest city <laughs> in the United States, which it was. Right. Uh, and an interesting story about Brooklyn uh, is that Manhattan wanted to take over Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And they had three referendums on whether they wanted to be taken over. Uh, and they lost the first two, and then they built the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and in 1898, the same year that the United States took over the Philippines uh, and, uh, you know, and Hawaii and Puerto Rico, uh, Manhattan took over Brooklyn. <laughs> that's, that's a good historical context there.